Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, you may have received a sermon sheet when you walked in. Did you get one of these today? If you didn't, don't worry about it. You can grab one on the way out. I forgot to tell the ushers uh, to hand them out. But if you have one with you in your worship folder, feel free to use that uh, to follow along with the sermon. There's some questions for the sermon and then some questions to answer when you get home. So if you didn't get one, feel free to grab one before you leave today. They're by the worship folders. Our sermon lesson for this morning is from Revelation chapter 22. This last Tuesday, Americans voted for its 45th president. Some people are very happy with the results of that election. Some people are very disappointed. Some people are indifferent. If you paid attention to the election coverage on Tuesday night, there were tears of joy for some people, tears of sadness for other people. When you think about this last presidential election, I think it's safe to say there was a lot of turmoil and emotion about it, and there probably will be for the next few days, weeks, and even, and even months. The Sundays that take place today and next week are the perfect Sundays when we think about turmoil in our lives, in our country, in the world. Today is Saints Triumphant Sunday where our eyes are focused on our heavenly home that awaits all believers in Christ. We thank the Lord for rescuing home to heaven, fellow Christians who are now at rest from their labors, and we look forward to that day ourselves. Next Sunday is Christ the King Sunday, where we'll be reminded that regardless of who gets elected, Christ is still King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and he rules over all things. But today, our thoughts and our focus is on heaven and the glory that awaits us. Revelation chapter 22 is the last chapter of the Bible, and our lesson is the last vision in the Bible. When you ever have a vision, you have to remember what it is exactly. A vision is a symbolic picture that communicates a truth or a reality. And Revelation 22 communicates to us heaven and what heaven is going to be like. So why don't we take a look at Revelation 22 for a few moments this morning and be comforted of the glories that await all believers in Christ. Our first few verses of our lesson says this, Then the angel showed me, that's the apostle John, who received this vision from the Lord. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. Heaven here is pictured as a city. And right in the middle of the city there is a street, and right along the street there is this river. And this river is called the river of the water of life. What does that mean? Well, whenever the Bible talks about the water of life, it's talking about the gospel message. Later on in Revelation 22, we're told this, Come, whoever is thirsty, let him come, and whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of the water of life. Jesus once told a Samaritan woman, Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The water of life is Jesus' love, his forgiveness, his grace and peace. It's our salvation. The gospel message is what the Holy Spirit uses to create and strengthen faith in our hearts. The gospel message is what gives us life, spiritual life, eternal life. Did you notice where this water of life comes from in our lesson? We're told that it comes from the throne of God and of the Lamb. It comes from our Savior. Our salvation, our forgiveness before God certainly doesn't come from within us. We can't earn it. We can't deserve it. But it is a free gift of God. A free gift that is received by us through faith. And notice how it was described. It's described as clear as crystal. God's grace and forgiveness in Christ, it has no impurities. It's perfect and complete. That's what you have right now. That's what is meant by the water of life. 
But notice what's around the water of life. In our lesson it says, On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Notice what surrounds this water of life, this salvation. It's the tree of life. Do you remember the tree of life anywhere else in the Bible? Actually see it at the very beginning. You see it in the first few chapters of Genesis when God creates the Garden of Eden. The tree of life is in that garden. And so it's interesting that the first few chapters of the Bible talk about the tree of life and then the tree of life gets mentioned again in the very last chapter of the Bible, a picture of heaven. They kind of act like bookends. Got the beginning, the Garden of Eden, the tree of life there, then the tree of life in heaven. But what do you see in between those two events? You see turmoil and violence. You see people treating one another poorly, people taking advantage of people. You see people insulting one another. You see jealousy and, and pride. You see selfishness. You see anger and hostility. You see hurtful words, and the list could go on and on and on. We see that around ourselves, but we also see it within ourselves too. You know what happened. It all happened in that very first garden, the Garden of Eden, because there was another tree in that garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and God commanded Adam and Eve not to eat from that tree. But along came Satan, who took the form of the serpent and deceived them. Adam and Eve ate from that tree. They broke God's command, and just like that, everything, perfection, was lost. Sin and violence entered into this world, but then sin was also passed down from generation to generation, and it's been passed down to you and to me. Can you imagine being Adam and Eve after they sinned? Can you imagine the sinking feeling they must have felt as they had to leave the Garden of Eden, as they had to leave paradise? Can you imagine explaining it to their kids and then their grandchildren that would be born to them? You know, life wasn't always like this. This world wasn't always like this. We made a mess of everything. But that wasn't the only thing they had. See, before they left the Garden of Eden, God made a promise to them. A promise that gave them a real hope. He told them, that there was going to be someone, a descendant of Eve, an offspring of Eve, that would come and crush Satan's head. So you can imagine them telling their kids and their grandkids about this. You know, this world is a mess right now, but guess what? One day God's going to fix everything. One day a Savior is going to come who's going to crush the head of the serpent, and that's what Jesus did. That's what Jesus did on the cross on Good Friday when he gave his life for you and for me. He crushed Satan's head. Now through his perfect life, through his death on the cross, through his resurrection from the dead, God's verdict and declaration to you is not guilty, fully forgiven. Because in the waters of your baptism, God took your heart and he stole it back from Satan and cleansed it and made it to be his own. And in his word and his sacrament, he strengthens our faith in him. He brings us closer to him as he tells us what our status in Christ is. Our status is fully forgiven, fully redeemed. And because of that, God has declared you to be a saint. A saint is someone who is holy, someone who is without sin. And when we look at our lives, certainly we're not holy and we're not a saint by ourselves, but in Christ you are. You are declared holy and forgiven because of what Jesus has done for you. And so we wait. We wait in this world. We wait in the midst of the chaos. We wait in the midst of the turmoil to receive in full what Jesus has already won for us, to experience in full what Jesus has already won for us. Now, I'm not a big fan of country music, but a number of years ago, there was a country song released, and it played a lot on the radio. And there was a line in that song that said, 
Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to go right now. I think that's probably true. Uh, People want to go to heaven, but not right now. What we learn from Revelation 22 is that Christians, we can actually look forward to going home to heaven. That it will actually be the best day of our lives when Jesus brings us home And our lesson tells us why. It says this, No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. In heaven, there's no more curse. The curse of sin came into this world when Adam and Eve sinned, but in heaven it's completely reversed. That means there are no more backaches in heaven, no more surgery, no more cancer, no more loneliness, no more disappointment, no more feeling rejected and lost, no more sickness and sorrow, and no more death. And no more tears either. The curse of sin is gone in heaven. The lesson also says that in heaven we will serve God. Now at first that might seem kind of strange because serving doesn't seem to be all that great, but our service to the Lord in heaven will be wonderful. It'll be a joy and delight for us to do. Now what does this look like? I don't know exactly. The Bible certainly pictures believers in heaven singing God's praises to him. But maybe it'll also be like the Garden of Eden, where God had Adam and Eve work the the garden. And maybe in that way we'll serve God. Regardless of what it looks like exactly, it will be perfect, it will be a joy and delight, and we will do it with complete obedience. And we're not merely slaves in heaven too. Notice what it says at the end of the lesson. It says, we will reign forever and ever with Jesus. The next thing that gets mentioned here is that in heaven there will be no more night. That's probably hard for us to wrap our minds around the the significance of that statement. There will be no more night in heaven. And the reason why it's hard for us to understand that significance is we live in a world of electricity. Where when we go home at, at night and it's dark outside, we just turn on the lights and everything is light again. But imagine living in a world living at a time when there was no electricity. So that you would go home at night and it would be completely dark and maybe you have a few candles or a few oil lamps, but but that was it. And imagine living in an area that isn't quite as safe as Stevensville. What does darkness lead to? It leads to fear and worry and concern. You're, You're afraid that your safety is in danger. But in heaven, there's none of that. In heaven, there's no more darkness. There's no more fear and worry because the Lord God will be our light. He will give us complete joy and gladness in heaven. One more thing I want to talk about today. It says, in heaven, we will see Jesus' face. If you had to label something as the best part of heaven, what would it be? I think it would be hard for us to say in heaven, well, this will be good, this will be better, and this will be best because everything will be perfect. But what is the one thing you're looking forward to the most about heaven? I think this is at the top of my list, that we will see our Savior face to face. We will see the one who left his heavenly throne and came into our world to be our Savior. We'll see the one who stretched out his arms at the cross and had his hands and his feet nailed there to pay for every one of our sins. We'll see the one who conquered death and rose from the dead and now lives and rules eternally, and yet he knows each one of us by name. In heaven, we will see our Savior. His name will be on our hearts and on our heads. We will reign with him forever and ever. This isn't something that we need to worry about or be afraid of, but this is something we can look confidently towards. Because when the Lord calls us home to heaven, that will be the best day in our lives. 
But until then, we wait. We wait as we live in this world of chaos and turmoil. We wait even when it's difficult. We wait even when we face problems and, and hardships. We wait for our Savior, who will come and bring his people home. We wait for the new heavens and the new earth, which will be perfect in every way. We wait for the day when there will be no more curse, no more sin, no more sorrow, no more hurts and pains. We wait to see Jesus face to face. But as we wait here on earth, let's remember to work. Not to work for our salvation because that has been completed already through Christ. But let's grow together in our faith. And let's work together to share that saving message of Christ to people who don't know it yet. So that more and more people will hear of Jesus and more and more people will join us in the glories of heaven. Because when we finally get there, we'll confidently say, it was worth the wait. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun. For the Lord God will give them light. And they will reign forever and ever. Amen.